I'm going to ask you to get your Bibles and open them in the book of Romans. And let me read a passage for you that is in chapter 8 in the book of Romans. I will take the privilege, allowing this to be informal. It's Wednesday night. I'm not on the upper floor, so I think I can be a little bit less formal. I'm not sure what you've studied in the past, uh, say, related to the book of Romans. Do you know that the book of Romans was the sixth book that Paul wrote? And that poses a problem, or a question rather. The question is, then, why is it in first place? If it was the sixth book that was written, why is it not put into the Bible in the order in which it was written? Have you ever thought about that? When you take the books that are in the Bible, you get the four Gospels at the beginning, and then you have to have a book of Acts before you can come to the Epistles. The book of Acts is what we call a transitional book. It takes you out of the record of our Lord's life and takes you, preparing you for the beginning of apostolic leadership. And in the process of that preparing, it is transitional inasmuch as its key figure in the beginning is Peter, but in the latter part, it is Paul. The key experiences of the beginning were miraculous. They were not in the latter part. Peter was delivered from prison by an angel that simply walked him past the guards. But Paul ended up in prison by the time we ended the book. And uh, although he may have been released from prison for a period, he went back to prison and from there he went to his execution. So it's a transitional book. When you then come into the epistles, and that takes up basically the rest of the books of the New Testament, you divide them between Christian uh, Gentile books and Christian Hebrew books. The Gentile books begin in the book of Romans, and they go all the way through 2 Thessalonians. Then the Hebrew books begin in the book of Hebrews and go all the way through the book of Revelation. There's some interesting things about how it is laid out. We have reason to believe that the Spirit of God inspired the words that found their way into the pages of our New Testament. Suffice it to say, we're even persuaded that the Spirit of the Lord directed the way these books appear in this order. When you're in the book of Romans, you're dealing with the great theme of salvation. When you come into the book of Ephesians, you're into another basic theme and that is seated in heavenly places with Christ or a life of victory in the Christian experience. When you come into the book of Thessalonians, you are dealing with the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you examine the Hebrew books, you will find out they're in the same order. In fact, if you examine the book of Hebrews, you will find the same truth that is taught by Paul in Romans to Gentile Christians, but this time it is now to Hebrew Christians, and the book is the same truth as a Hebrew would understand it. And that is the difference in the arguments of these two books. So you have those three uh, books that take a segment, and then between each of them you have two books. The After Romans you have Corinthians and Galatians. After Ephesians, you have Philippians and Colossians. And they differ because uh, Corinthians and Galatians are correctional books. Romans wasn't. They, it was only given in the book of Romans simply to present truth. But in the book of, of Corinthians, they were correcting error. And in the book of Galatians, they were correcting error. And when you go past the book of Ephesians, and take Philippians and Colossians, it's the same thing again. They are correcting errors. What errors are they correcting? In Corinthians and Galatians, the error of what was taught in Romans. And in Philippians and Colossians, the error of what was taught in Ephesians. There is no error that falls after the presentation of the second coming of Christ in Thessalonians. Another thing that's significant, when you look at these two correctional books between the major books, 
The first of them is correcting uh, an ignorant denial of the major book, which is Romans. The second one is an ignorant denial of that truth. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? They didn't know that they were in error, but they were willfully in error in the book of Corinthians. So knowing the book as, the, as it unfolds in the New Testament will give you an idea that if you start reading in the book of Romans to learn the truth that is in the epistles, you will find Paul establishing truth in Romans and then correcting mistakes related to that truth. Then establishing the truth of the Lordship of Christ and then correcting mistakes related to the Lordship of Christ. And therefore, it becomes intelligent to read, not hodgepodge, but to read through because you're reading consecutive arguments that are building up, and it's a, an advantage. In the book of Romans, where my interest is tonight, and I'm going to be looking in chapter 8, but in the book of Romans, you know that in the first three chapters of this book, we have sin condemned. Righteousness is required. Uh, when you read those three chapters, keep that in mind. Number one, you look at the man that's in the first part of this uh, book, and uh, he is essentially is arguing, God can't send me to hell because I'm one of the pagans and I never heard the name of Jesus. So no right does God have to send me to hell. But you listen to how Paul argues, because Paul appears almost like a prosecutor in a courtroom. And the man that's making the argument, though we've never heard the argument, we know what it is from what the prosecutor says. And he is explaining to the judge, who is God, uh, the reason that these people are guilty. And he states, for example, in uh, chapter 1, what verse is it? that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, became vain in their imagination, or foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God, like unto a four-footed beast and creeping things, wherefore God gave them up. And he goes through and explains how they became heathen, because they had light given to them by God, and they didn't live up to the light God gave to them. Wherefore, God gave them up. Some very revealing facts in that passage. Because we are troubled today with a, a catastrophe of AIDS. Because of a social sin that has become a disease rampant on the earth. And I remember one man saying, and I agreed with him, that God, you can't expect God to come in judgment because of that sin. He doesn't. That sin is here because he has already come in judgment. You read through chapter 1, and you find out that before that sin became socially acceptable, God gave them up, and three different times in stages of degeneration. So the only reason the heathen can say, I never heard the name of Jesus, is because he did hear about God, but he didn't live up to the light that God gave him. Therefore, Paul says, in essence, he deserves to go to hell. The one that comes in the second chapter is the Jew. And the Jew, in essence, says, you can't send me to hell because I'm part of the elect. I'm part of the chosen people of God. And born a Jew is a privilege, and therefore, I should not have to go to hell. But you listen to Paul's argument here, graphically given, just simply like this. Wherefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For therein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou doest the same things. You know, born with elective privileges doesn't get a person to heaven. They have to. The only way they can go to heaven is by denial whatever rights election may have to them as a chosen people and seeking a refuge in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way that they can go. When you come into the third chapter, the man in the third chapter is arguing, you can't send me to hell because if any man deserves not to go to hell, I am that man. I am a moral man. I am a good man. I will not say that I am perfect, but I will say that I am better than the people that I know, 
and my morality should become a standard for other people that live in my community. Now, I personally believe, if you listen to this man speaking, his argument goes like this. Take my good deeds and take my bad deeds and put them down on a weighing scale. And if my good deeds don't outweigh my bad deeds, then you have a right to send me to hell. But if they do outweigh them, you have no right to send me to hell. Now you listen to Paul saying why that man is wrong. He said, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. They have all gone out of the way together, become perverse. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they use to seek. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then in verse 19 he says, uh, as a total to all of this, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped and the whole world guilty before God. So there's nobody can stand in the presence of Paul and draw any assumptions that he has another method of reaching God other than through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the functional purpose of those first three chapters. That takes you down to verse 20 in chapter 3, because in verse 30, verse 21 through verse 31, you are given the plan of salvation. Maybe surprise you. No other place do I know of in the New Testament where the plan of salvation is given as it is given there. That is a very unique passage and one that every Christian ought to thoroughly acquaint himself with because that is the ground of our salvation and our hope. When you come into chapter 4, in chapter 4, you're looking in the Old Testament because if a man is saved, predicated upon an exercise of faith, saved by grace, but through faith. If that does happen, is that any way different than it was in olden days? And the argument of Paul is, no, you read chapter 4, and you find out that he gives you the illustration of Abraham and decides that Abraham was saved because he believed. And he takes the person of David the king, one is the founder of the nation, the other is the founder of the throne. And he shows you that both of those people were saved by the same principle that Paul was preaching to the people in New Testament times. God has not two plans of salvation, only one plan of salvation. And that is the issue of that chapter, chapter 4. When you come into chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8, in chapter 5, he is showing you the great truth about atonement and showing you how the atonement works out in our lives. He makes some comments when he is doing that, which brings him to the question, what shall we do then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And so that brings up two questions. He answers one in chapter 7. Uh, Wherefore then serveth the law? And he explains the part that the law had in becoming a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. Then in chapter 8, it is related to grace because those two questions come out of chapter 5 and they're parenthetical. When we come into chapter 8, the passage that I want you to look at because this is the end of his argument. And so I'm beginning to read for you in verse 28. As I say, this is the end of the argument you get into chapter 9, 10, and 11, it's parenthetical related to the Jew. And in chapter 12, as in all Paul's epistles, he applies practically what he had been teaching theoretically. So we're looking at the end of the theory that Paul was preaching. And it begins in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. Now here is the key verse. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, 
who can be against us. And that is the verse that ties together this piece of context that I am reading for you. We begin in verse 32 again. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. So there's no charge. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So there is no judge. That's his second basic argument. His third argument takes us from verse 35 to the end of the chapter. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persian, persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now what I want to do with the time that I have left is to analyze these arguments because I do know that we are human and in the frailty of human experience we frequently ask questions we really shouldn't be asking. And the question that's being asked here, if God be for us, who can be against us? Is God for us? Now remember, Paul has just elaborated this mammoth uh, thesis on God's plan of salvation. And he's gone through carefully detailing every point that was important for God to communicate with man regarding such a thing. And now the question comes up, is God for us? You can be a part of the best church in town. You can be thoroughly acquainted with the word of God. You can be an energetic Christian, sharing and witnessing for Christ, and still get subject to those questions of doubt. Is God really for us? I mean, am I getting so myopic, I'm not getting the proper picture? And if I saw the picture properly, I'd realize that I have every reason to question if God is for us. Well, Paul says, no reason to question. And he gives us three basic arguments to show us that God does love us and loves us unconditionally. And the three basic arguments will take us. The first one, he is for us encouragingly in the mystery of his providence. And that begins in verse 28 and takes you down through verse 30. Having read them, look again. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And... Uh, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinated, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. I will tell you that I feel certain assurance just in the way that is outlined. Because you'll notice there that this salvation does not begin with a human experience. It does not begin with the decision of the human will. That's not really where salvation begins. That is an effect, not a cause. Whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate. Whom he predestinated, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. I know when you go back in your experience and you stop and think about, how did I find God? you get a proper objective view of it, I think you'll come to the conclusion, it was God who found me. I know I was searching for him, but I was never able to find him by my search. I was discovered by his searching. 
he tells the story of a man that had a hundred sheep and one of them at night when he folded them, one was missing. He sold the 99 to a hireling and he went out after that one sheep. And uh, out in the rocky mountain deep, out went the shepherd to search for his sheep. He searched till he found it. With love bands he bound it. And I was that one lost sheep. It was really the story of God searching for me more than it was of me searching for God. And that's an important truth. We call this providence. And providence is a combination of two Latin words, pro video. And video means to see, pro means before. So that essentially providence is God's ability to see things before. And in view of what God can see and we cannot see, all things work together for good. Now, this is where a big problem comes. Because it's great and easy to live for God on the mountaintop. But when you're down in the valley, and where things are not running smoothly, and where feelings are being ruffled with your friends, and you're getting into complicated financial difficulties, and this thing is happening, and that thing is happening, and another thing is happening, isn't that when we question it? We say, well, God, if you were alive, why am I suffering this way? Why do I have to endure these difficulties? It's the same thing that David spoke about at a later time. Suffice it to say that it's another way of saying, I think I can see the future better than God can. We can't. We think we can, but we can't. He knows what's best. You look at the difficulties that Joseph had, sold by his brothers, then standing loyal for moral truth, sent to prison, then forgotten in prison, then eventually brought out of prison and brought into a position of prestige. And when his own brothers came to him, he said to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good never brought an accusation against the Lord because of his trials. Recognized that his trials were but for him only stepping stones that were leading him into the center of God's will and making everything peaceful for him and bearing witness to the same truth we're sharing with each other. All things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. I don't know if you know the story of Bernard Gilpin, who was one of the martyrs, or to be one of the martyrs, during the Reformation period when Bloody Mary was on the throne. And he was sent into prison, and uh, his favorite verse was this verse, all things work together for good to them that love God. And he quoted it again and again. And when he was in the prison, he quoted it to the jailer. And the jailer became annoyed at him, a man facing death and he's quoting scripture and of all the scripture he's quoting he's trying to say that everything works together for good and it aggravated the jailer well in the process of time he was on his way to his execution and uh, the jailer was particularly annoyed at him because I mean the jailer hadn't come into a cell to get him to take him to his execution then he quoted his verse to him again and he said, I don't know how you can quote it like that. You're on your way out to die. I mean, the end of this trail is death. And you're quoting all things work together for good? Well, he saw his side of it and the jailer saw his side. The jailer was so aggravated at him that while he was walking, he jerked the chains. And when he did, they twisted around the legs of Gilpin and uh, he actually fractured or broke a bone in his legs and collapsed on the floor and couldn't walk. There was a law that if the man could not walk in his own strength to his execution, they can't execute him until he can. And so the jailer had to go over there, pull up that heap of flesh that was lying all broken up and lift him up into his arms in order to carry him back to the cell. And while he's holding him in his arms, Gilpin has his arms around his jailer's neck holding on 
and he's whispering into his ear, all things work together for good to them that love God. You and I can't see it, and that is the pity of it, because could we see it, we'd never frown in a day of despair. We'd recognize there is no way that things will not accommodate the good of a man that puts his trust in God. No matter what the outcome might be, it is in God's mind still more perfect. God sees the future. It's all in providence. I don't know if you ever get confused by some of the language because this there's been, you know, a theological battle that has been fought for ages. Is man truly free? Is God truly sovereign? Is it not true that if God were sovereign, man could not be free? And we've been fighting, and you can go to the arena where these battles have been fought, and you find the scalps of some of the greatest theologians that died in that battlefield. All I will tell you, because to me, it works out perfectly. It's just the same way that these other problems work out, everything together for good. And it's simply Thomas Edison, who was one of America's great inventors. Thomas Edison had become famous and had built a palatial home. It had beautiful, sprawling gardens, winding pathways, but they led to a gate that let you into the premise that was apparently an old gate, a rickety gate, not properly fixed on its hinges, squeaked with a noise when it was open, and took enormous pressure to open it. And the neighborhood didn't like that. He was an inventor, and so many people were coming by from America to see the place where Thomas and Edison lived, that what is out in front was important. Come on, you need to clean it up. You're an inventor. We know you can build a better gate than that. When they challenged him on it, his face cracked a grin, his eyes twinkled, and he said to them, I never force one of you to come into my garden. But any of you that decided so to do, you pushed that old gate to get in. And when you did, you pushed a gallon of water into a tank that's in the roof of my house. You acted of your own free will, but in doing so, you fulfilled a predetermined purpose that I had. And in the same way, I believe we can say to the world, whosoever will, let him come. And when they come with that kind of an invitation, and we can easily give it without any shame, when they walk inside the gate and look back over their shoulder, they'll see written across the gate, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. I am free. He is sovereign. One does not destroy the other. They work in perfect harmony. Suffice it to say, the argument that Paul has given is very simply, all things work together for good. Now, know the hope of his calling, and you'll get the assurance God does love you and will never alter that love. That brings us then to the second argument, and it begins in verse 32. He that spared not, this is efficaciously in the sacrifice of his son, he that spared not, uh, let me find my place, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? For who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. That's the other reason that he gives. You can be assured of it that God is for you. Now, how do we describe this assurance? As I said, it's efficaciously. It's in the sacrifice of his son. Because one of the greatest evidences that God loves, told to us throughout the scriptures, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whenever I get questioning in my darkness, in my despair, when my heart feels deserted, are you really for me, Lord? 
I can almost hear Paul calling to me from the passage and saying to me, go back to Calvary. Go look at the cross. Would you ever question that God was for you and look at God's only begotten Son suffering, suspended between heaven and earth, railed at by men and even cursed by his own Father? who opened up his righteous vengeance and let it fall on his son, his only begotten, his beloved son? How could anybody question that God would allow that to happen and at the same time question, does God love me? Because that man who died at the cross died for me. And it's an amazing thing. There is a verse, and it's a verse that I love to quote it's in Romans chapter 5 and it's in verse 10 and I think it highlights this verse I'm looking at in Romans 5 10 for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life that is exactly what Paul is saying in this passage who is he that died? It was Christ that died. Ye rather that is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, who is making intercession for us. How could God possibly not be in favor for, of you and of love for you if he died for you when you were sinners? There was nothing in you to commend him to this act of death at the cross. And you think about that. We were enemies, alienated by wicked works. And yet he came and died for us. If he would do that while we were enemies, what would he do for us now that we are reconciled? And now that the one who came as the example and proof of his love is now at his right hand making intercession for us. You just compare these two conditions. And the Apostle Paul is saying, there is no way creditable that you could question that God could love you now. The blood has been shed. The reconciliation has been made. The advocate is at God's right hand. He liveth to make intercession for you. If any concept of, of alienation in God's mind against us could possibly happen. It surely couldn't happen under those conditions. I don't know if you ever think about it. God so loved that he gave. How much is that? I mean, you stop and think about it. He said in chapter 5, Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Peradventure for a good man, some might even dare to die. But God commended this love toward us in it while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's a profound truth. Is there any way that you can put some kind of a label on that love? You could tell what its tensity is. You know, what's its felicity? Uh, you, we, we get staggered by it. The biggest stretch of desert that we have in the United States is between El Paso and San Diego. And for the sake of an illustration, suppose that there is a house in El Paso, there is a plant that is generating electrical power. It is taking that power and pushing it across the desert through cables until it comes to the area of uh, San Diego. And in San Diego, that power, that current, coming through there from El Paso, hits two inches of twisted Belgian sand. It hits a force of resistance. And the moment it does, it demands by that force of resistance, demonstrate your power. And the light comes on in the homes in San Diego. Now think about it. How much did he love us? You go to the cross. You watch my Lord suspended in agony. His body was mutilated. He was, he was riled by the people that did it. 
his experience on the cross if ever there was an evidence that he loved us it was on the cross that is the strongest example of God's love to me I will ever find especially when I was in the alienated condition that I was in but think about it supposing we take an apparatus and we drive along beside those electrical wires suppose we come to a place in a bleak deserted part of the desert and we take the device and clip it to the wires and test the power it's the same it's not any different in the middle of the desert than it is in the home in San Diego it's the same you see love with him never changes and no matter where you try to put it to the test the power that is any part of it is equal to the power where it is manifested in San Diego it is the same for us I have to remember when my heart faces disaster and I feel like I've lost my last friend in life and I don't know which way to go and I try to pray and the heavens become like brass and I'm not able to make my way through to God and everything is against me when I feel like that I need to get down and remember he died for me at the cross and remember any moment the tensity of that love is as great as it was at Calvary it never changes if that is true, then we can say honestly, if God be for us, who can be against us? There is no way that I can listen to intelligent argument that could upset my heart and cause me to falter on my faith. There is no way that I can do it and keep my mind on what Paul is trying to get me to think of in this passage of Scripture. I am totally secure and I rest in a love that has never re yet been measured fully measured all I know is that the vilest offender that truly believes that moment in Jesus a pardon receives therefore love exemplified by the cross I am the object of it tonight I am the object of it in my deepest trial and I can say he knows what lies in the future and he knows what is best for me I will rest in that you see I have a great interest I don't say that I have a delight in conducting funerals but I like doing it I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying I like doing it because I believe if ever there is a time that God needs a representative it's at the funeral when a loved one is gone, when nothing's going to occupy the vacancy that is left, when the heart is stunned, broken, what does that person need to know? You need to know that God's love is infinite. You need to know that God's power is infinite. You need to know that God's wisdom is infinite and if these be true whatever happened to your loved one this is true the power is so great he could have changed the course easily the wisdom is so perfect he did exactly the thing that was right and this love is so infinite there's no way that you for a moment could think that it was the absence of love that allowed him to let this event happen all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose in a few minutes let's just look at the last one we begin reading in the last one eternally in the fellowship of his love is what Paul is saying when you begin verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ and listen to carefully what he says 
because in what he is saying in verse 35 he's given you seven different reasons that frequently suggest that the love of Christ has changed shall tribulation that means trouble distress persecution famine nakedness peril sword that's war can anything between trouble and war separate us from the love of Christ no categorically not he says as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us don't read that to say in spite of these things that is not what he is saying he says in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us that is powerful you see God is so great his power is unlimited his strength is without measure and because of that no matter how the devil works and he only works under permission from God and no matter how he works his wickedest attempt against us becomes an instrument that be, turns out to be the very opposite in his, in his effort to try and get us to drift away from fellowship with God the very instruments he uses to accomplish it have the opposite effect and they bring us closer to him. I will guarantee you, look back over your shoulder. Remember the days when your heart was breaking and your eyes were red and you made tears your drink for days. I will assure you of something. You knew my Lord you were closer to him in those moments than you would ever be in the day of prosperity. He becomes more real to you. When you get to the place, it's like the death of a dream. When you get to the place that you find out that you are not adequate to cope with these things, a true believer then learns how to lean on him. And the things that are against me are not against me at all. They are instruments in the kindest providence of God that simply make me more like my Savior and make me cling to him. I'll tell you what Paul's saying in this. He said, for thy sakes, now he's quoting the scripture, we are killed all the day long, we're accounted like sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Can I give you the principle that Paul is trying to share with you there? He's trying to say this. Get the overview. Stand back and use the telescope just so that you can see the whole thing. And that's a basic principle in scripture remember when Paul was speaking to the Corinthians in the second letter and he states to them in the fourth chapter our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory it's light affliction it's a weight of glory it's affliction, but it produces glory. It's light affliction for a moment. It's an eternal weight of glory. Get the overview. It's easy for me to go through the moments of pressure when I know that from the moments of pressure an eternal purpose is being worked out for which I become the benefactor. And that is exactly what Paul is trying to say here. Do you remember David's confession in Psalm 73 where he confessed 
that his feet had well nigh slipped. He looked at the wicked, their eyes bulged out with fatness. They had more than heart could want. And I am plagued all the day long. He said in essence, if you read down because it's a spiritual biography of a failure, and when he's, when he's expressing it, he, in essence, he simply said that I got to the place where I decided there's no use being a Christian. I mean, I get hurt every day. These men get up in the morning and they get up to days of prosperity and ease and benefit to them. What am I going to do? He said, then... I went into the sanctuary and I saw their end. God set their feet in slippery places. I, remarkable, he got it in the sanctuary. He got it in the company of other believers. And they helped him in the moments of praise and worship. In the encounter with God, they brought him to a place where he could see, I'm looking at too small a part of this. I've got to see this whole thing in front of me. And once he got the view of the total picture, then his foot caught hold, and he recovered from his backsliding. That's the story that is given to us here. Look at that last passage because I think that one it's terrific I am persuaded that neither death nor life think of what he said that means the sphere of human experience neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers the spirit world nor things present, nor things to come. Time categories. Nor height, nor depth. Space related. You can walk into any of these areas and you can examine them from one extremity to the other extremity. And whether it's in the world of humans or in the world of spirits or in the world of space, doesn't matter what world you wouldn't that should Satan ever tempt you to where you think it is true. Think of these arguments. Let me close by telling you that I'm only on my way through London. I'm going to the little, I say little, it's, it's a little town in Indian truth little town of Kota, but eight hours in a train south of New Delhi. No tourists ever go there. They don't have any hotels. They don't have any restaurants. You have to stay with the people. There's Bible school there with about 150 young men and women that are training for full-time service, plus the staff. I'm going there for four weeks, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, they put you to work at 8.30 in the morning. And they end you about 10.30 at night and they let you off to eat something now and again. I mean, they really work you. I was there before, and I will never forget it. And I wish I would covenant that every one of you had the experience that I had. I will never forget it. There were two other Americans with me, and the three of us were preaching a week's meeting from Sunday through Sunday. And then on Friday, we had graduation. The building, which was a little bigger than this, was crammed every day. And we had to go up onto the roof. All the roofs are flat. And we had to meet on the roof. Well over a thousand people would be meeting there. There were men that came from different parts of India that graduated from that school and had gone out and built churches. And I never listened to them when they gave their testimonies. Until one time, M.A. Thomas, who was the leader of this group, when one brother stood up and wanted to give a testimony, M.A. Thomas, in his inimicable Indian accent, he said, I would like to tell you about my brother before he testifies. Because it was two years ago that he called me up and he said, Brother Thomas, I don't know what to do. 
And I said, why, my brother? He said, because I have had a meeting with the five leaders of our city. They're all Hindus. They tell me that if I'm not gone from here by Friday, that they will kill me. They'll kill my wife. They'll kill my children. And they will burn all my property. And I do not know what to do. And I said to my brother, I said, my dear brother, you don't have a choice. You've only forgotten for a moment. Heaven is a much nicer place than Kota. I listened. I mean, once I listened, I realized I was listening to that story reproduced over and over and over again. One man pulled a shirt up and showed me a lacerated back. The last beating he had had been nearly a month ago, and he'd had five of these beatings threatening him that they would do worse if he didn't get out of the place, and he stayed right there where they were. On graduation night on Friday night, I don't know how many people, because we had to reach over onto other rooftops. We had ampli amplification equipment every night, and we could reach these other places. We're in a hostile land. We're having, a, we're having our service graduate in a group of students who are going out to build churches. I mean, raw, cold churches in cities where there's not one known Christian living in the city. And every young man graduating is going to that purpose. Every young lady is going to a church previously built and working with the pastor and his wife of that other church to help them to grow and do and work for them. On this night, Emmy Thomas said to these young men, he said, I have thought this over, young people, and I am going to decline to give you a diploma if you will not covenant with God that under no circumstance will you ever try to avoid martyrdom. I just will not give you a diploma. I had never been to a Bible school where that was a condition of graduation. He said, it is not enough for me that you will consent to do this because if you make this covenant with God, I want to be a witness to it. I want everybody present to witness. You will have to stand to your feet. And I saw those young people not, in, not at once. I mean, it was not something they were prepared for. They had to make their mind up on the spot. I get my diploma, and I go out, and if God wants me to die for him, I will not try and avoid it. I'll never forget. He called them over when they all stood up, and he got them around in a half-moon circle in front of him. And he said, I'd like to pray for you. And I heard him saying something strange in prayer. He said, Lord, will you help me to word my prayer? So I want to include myself. In fact, I want to include all my minister friends that are present. I'm one of them sitting over in the corner. He said, loving Father, we would count it a great joy if you would let us die. Then he let the kids go back and sit down. Then he said, Dr. Connolly, you will come along and speak to us. And I felt like a pygmy among giants. I thought, what a strange thing to request. And then it dawned on me, that's the same thing that's requested in Scripture. Because if you read 1 John 3, verse 16, you find out that hereby perceive we the love of God. That's what we looked at tonight. He laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That means the person sitting next to you. And if I know his love and you know his love, that should be the result of that knowledge. If God be for us, who can be against us? If I understand his love, nothing can be against us. Let's pray. Our dear Father, we pause for a moment. First of all, we want to thank you for the dear Lord who came from the splendor and glory of heaven to this old sin-cursed crust of earth and came to poverty and to shame and was ill-treated by his own and eventually died on a cross, they doing the executing, but you punishing him and putting him to death because it pleased the Lord to bruise him. We are amazed when we reconsider the cross. 
And I'd just like to pray, Father, for these friends with whom I fellowship tonight and to whom I become your ambassador to speak your word. I'd just like to pray that somehow you'll chase away all the doubts that they may have in their minds and help them not only to remember Calvary, but in the terms in which we've been speaking, to reproduce it to a dying world that everyone else may know. And we'll be careful to see that you get the credit.